Welcome to Gradient Proof, a long-form discussion on a range of topics from AI to philosophy to entrepreneurship. We start each podcast sober and let the proof gradient the course of discussion. As always, we encourage you to drink with us. Welcome to The Gradient. Welcome to The Gradient Proof. Today we have a special guest. Uh, Douglas, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Douglas Wyatt. Uh, I'm an attorney and I have uh, interest in environment, law, and technology. I, I have my own practice in New York, but uh, I've had uh, over 20 years of experience volunteering for a, a scientific research program, the Foundation for Glacier Environmental Research. And uh, we uh, run a yearly program up in Alaska to study glaciers, uh, to provide education, and to maintain one of the longest running measures of a glacier system in the world. Uh, we've been doing it since 1946. Uh, I ran the program uh, for a brief period of time uh, just as uh, the president of the foundation. Uh, we have a, usually a director uh, who handles some of the logistics, manages all the people on the ground, gets the money in, and uh, that program usually is somewhere between 50 and 100 people uh, who participate each summer over about a two months period of time on the Juneau Ice Field. That's fascinating. So um, since, since you started your involvement with, with the organization, um, I guess what have you seen as the, the biggest shift? Um, maybe it's on a, um, a, a testing or observance standpoint or potentially uh, how the work is observed from, from the people conducting it, or how they're able to talk about that, um, and, and things of that nature. Right. Well, we uh, will do uh, studies of the glacier and uh, – maintain uh, the, the total amount of ice on the ice field, see where, it, where, where we're at. And over a number of years, we've seen great fluctuations, but also a, a tendency downwards. That is, the glaciers are uh, continuing to melt, waste away, uh, much more so than their uh, long-term measurements. Uh, and so it is, I wouldn't say alarming, but it is very concerning. Uh, we do things on a, a local level. Uh, so on our local level, we understand that uh, our glaciers on the Juneau ice field are, are changing. I was up there uh, when I was in high school a long time ago, and uh, the, the ice was different. Uh, the, the temperatures, the environment was much different. Uh, the glaciers were larger, I could just tell, uh, by comparison to when I was there in 2018. And uh, in the past, in let's say uh, 1991 or uh, 1987 when I was there, uh, the glaciers were large. Uh, they were bowed out. That is, there was a great accumulation of snow during the summer uh, that maintained during the summer. And uh, uh, these, these summers uh, today, in the last few years, uh, the amount of accumulation is much less. So we see uh, a significant reduction in the quantity of ice retained on these glacier fields. And uh, it provides, you know, a, 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 a direction to what we should be concerned about. Well, we're uh, seeing how uh, local temperatures are rising. That is the uh, freezing point uh, where snow will fall. Uh, instead of falling, let's say, around 3,000 feet. It's, it's higher, perhaps, around 4,000 feet. Uh, and so you're having a, a, an accumulation layer uh, much higher uh, on the ice field. And uh, that affects, obviously, the, the amount of, of snow that's accumulated in these mountainous regions. And uh, that is retained uh, over the summer. Again, it, all the snow usually falls during the winter time, sometimes 30, 40 feet of snow. And uh, during the summertime is when we can do our studies uh, when the snow melts and we're able to access our camps. Uh, sometimes in the past, we'd have to actually dig down to the camp uh, hmm. to dig out the snow. Uh, these days, we don't have that issue anymore. Uh, in the past, we'd have uh, these uh, great snowfalls during the summer where you can barely uh, uh, travel uh, one day without a whiteout. That is, uh, you're traveling through a blizzard. And these days, uh, it's bright sun. Uh, in the past, uh, the glaciers were so covered in snow that the crevasses that uh, you typically encounter 
cross-country skiing across the ice field, which is what we do. We, we travel from camp to camp uh, with a backpack and cross-country skis. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we'd have to use those uh, skis and ski over these crevasses. And sometimes it's just a tiny crack because there's enough snow to cover the, cr the crevasses. These days, uh, we can't even go from our very first camp across to our uh, further camps because there are so many crevasses. Mm -hmm. We have to take a helicopter, uh, or uh, exclude some of those early camps as part of the trip uh, and just go directly uh, to the higher camps where there's more snow. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we're just to zoom out for a second, um, uh, why, are, why is that the glacier that you guys are observing versus you know, potentially other glaciers? And I guess just to orient ourselves in the world, you know, where is this? Uh, what's kind of the closest maybe metropolitan area uh, Right. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the Juneau Ice Field is just situated just above Juneau, which is the capital of Alaska. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, uh, landlocked. That is where you really can't get in by boat. Uh, sorry, by, by car. You have to get in by boat or plane. Um, and the Juneau Ice Field extends all the way into Canada. Uh, so when we travel, we're uh, crossing uh, the international uh, boundary and uh, into Canada, and we'll, we'll spend uh, eight weeks uh, crossing the glaciers uh, from one camp to the next. Mm -hmm. It was started by Dr. Maynard M. Miller, uh, again, 1946, and uh, he was the chief geologist on the first successful American expedition up Everest. Uh, so he was up there. Uh, uh, with Whitaker uh, doing uh, science while the others were climbing Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. And uh, our group, an early group, comprised of uh, uh, climbers, mountaineers, uh, and also glaciologists. Now, the reason why we choose the Juneau Ice Field is that, uh, at first, it's accessible uh, to, uh, to Juneau, which is a, a major city center. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have our usually our base camp starting out in Juneau. Uh, we break our bags out to make sure we have all our equipment, then we go and hike up to the ice field. Uh, there are other uh, major city centers, for example, Seattle, which is close to uh, uh, Mount Rainier, uh, which has a, a fairly nice glacier. Mm -hmm. But the Juneau ice field comprises many glaciers. So in terms of having a long-term study, uh, it's much more valuable for uh, seeing how uh, a large area, uh, a large accumulation zone, mm -hmm. um, uh, reflects uh, changes in climate. Uh, and the other interesting thing about Juneau and the Juneau Ice Field is that it's a temperate glacier. Uh, it's fairly warm glacier, uh, and uh, it is close to uh, uh, large weather patterns. Uh, so the variability uh, of the glacier is seen uh, sorry, variability and, and weather patterns are really seen dramatically on the ice field. Uh, it is a temperate glacier, and so you'll see these changes much more rapidly. So it's sensitive to uh, variations in, in temperature, variations in climate. Yeah, other, other glaciers around the world, for example, um, uh, high altitude glaciers, let's say in Peru uh, or uh, in the Himalayas, uh, uh, may not see such variations. Uh, and then uh, there are also, uh, uh, or Antarctica, uh, they're also uh, uh, subject to larger, larger uh, forces, larger uh, ch uh, changes in mm -hmm. uh, environment. And it's very, a little harder to detect um, or pull in uh, local understanding. So in Juneau, we have a better idea because it's local weather. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you can see these things and over a short period of time, much more much more quickly. Right, right. So is, is the organization uh, focused primarily on recording and understanding the data, or is there also a component of uh, potentially addressing, intervening, uh, or you know, some kind of uh, uh, taking some t uh, type of action uh, in order to preserve some of those? Uh, we're, we are changes. a science and education organization. We're, we're not a policy organization. Um, we do not promote uh, any kind of political uh, agenda. Uh, we, we are focused on science and educating uh, our young students uh, who might become uh, leaders in the, the scientific community. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's not just on glaciers also. We, we, we talk about uh, geology, 
uh, uh, other uh, areas of environmental science, uh, hydrology, for example, uh, endocrinology. There are a lot of different other things that uh, we do. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, but again, we, we will take uh, high school, college, graduate students uh, up on the ice field, mm -hmm. uh, just a few uh, high school students because it's, it's a very rigorous environment. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll bring uh, professional researchers up uh, to uh, uh, do some of their projects and we will uh, provide them with uh, logistical support. Uh, for example, we a helicopter or uh, uh, Thiokol, which is a, a large snow track vehicle, mm -hmm. or uh, snowmobiles, which is our primary means of uh, means of locomotion and carrying gear and fuel from place to place. Great. Um, and then obviously, you know, taking care of uh, food and water uh, at the camps, and uh, and maintaining uh, uh, sort of a, a energy supply to recharge batteries for their their equipment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that we. We have a, a, a focus on science, and initially the program really was focused on just uh, uh, glaciers, um, but uh, other, other sciences have come up uh, to study uh, the trees, uh, to study the lichens, uh, and these are all uh, uh, related to understanding uh, the overall climate because they are affected by uh, variation. So lichen, for example, um, will only grow on uh, rock that has been exposed uh, to the sun and uh, and not covered by ice. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if uh, lichen has been covered by ice, uh, it's not going to grow. Uh, so, uh, if we measure uh, a lichen, uh, it has a certain uh, rate of, of growth. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, one particular uh, lichen, a Rhizocarpum geographicum, uh, will uh, have a very consistent rate of growth uh, depending on uh, uh, whether it's been uh, snow covered or not. And so making a statistical study about uh, these lichen, you'll get an understanding of uh, how long that uh, that glacier has been there and has been ice, ice free. And, and what are some of the, the estimated ages of the different parts of the, the ice field? Uh, well, the ice field's been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I do not know the sort of paleoclimate mm -hmm. uh, uh, record of it. I, I can only speak to 1946, sure. where, which I have been involved with. Um, and again, I, I'm not a, a scientist mm -hmm. uh, uh, with a, a scientific background degree, but I have an engineering degree. Um, and having uh, 20 years of practical experience, I've, I've learned uh, about some of these things. But mm -hmm. Um, we do do ice core uh, measurements, but uh, typically uh, these uh, mountain glaciers are refreshed, so to speak. That is, uh, the deep, deep ice uh, will flow down to the valley, and so you will not see old, old ice unless it's uh, in some form of a basin um, that has been there for a long period of time. Uh, in Antarctica, in Greenland, uh, you will see uh, uh, deep glaciers uh, that can remain a, a, a long-term record because they, uh, they are called cap glaciers. Um, and uh, the weight of the ice uh, will press down and preserve the, the oldest ice down in a, in a basin, so to speak. Uh, so you can do a deep core and understand uh, what was the quality of the, the atmosphere by studying uh, uh, the contents of the ice. So for example, um, ice core uh, studies will uh, uh, take a bore and take a cross section of that, that bore and uh, uh, determine what, was the, what are the constituents of, of the um, bubbles that are trapped in that ice. Uh, for example, you might find uh, a concentration of an isotype of oxygen uh, that uh, would indicate a certain period of time. Again, those are sort of paleoclimate records, and um, that is a very specific area of science. Um, and so by the, when we talk about, let's say, climate change generally, um, I'd say it's difficult to say a person is an expert in uh, climate change, a climate change expert. Um, there are so many different fields of science that comprise uh, 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 an area that uh, is important to understanding um, you know, the, the, the whole uh, climate of the earth. And so uh, we may have uh, a general understanding, uh, an individual may have a general understanding like myself. I have a very 
general understanding as a layperson on science, and another scientist may have uh, specific knowledge, let's say a physicist may have a specific knowledge on uh, one area of science and uh, a, a more of a layperson's, a lay scientist's attitude for uh, some, some, of these other, some of these other areas. But it is important to have a general idea because you put things into perspective. Um, an expert is an individual who has, uh, you know, through their experience, through their research, through uh, papers that they may uh, uh, write, um, an understanding as to the state of the art of whatever that is. And, uh, and an expert really is a relative term vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other, other er individuals in the field. Right. So uh, climate science, uh, at least since in 1946, uh, was new or almost non-existent. Mm. Um, uh, the, the, the understanding of science really dates back to uh, where individuals said, hmm, why, why is this particular rock, uh, an erratic, uh, found in this mountain town in Switzerland? Uh, in the middle of town. Why is that? Well, perhaps the glacier just above uh, the valley in this mountain town in Switzerland was dropped that rock, uh, this, this glacial erratic. Uh, one uh, Swiss scientist, I, I was, I, I, Agassi, uh, uh, made that uh, uh, observation. Um, anyway, so we, we, we do science by observing, uh, use uh, if we're out in nature, seeing what's out there, seeing what's happening in nature, observing, making measurements, and uh, recording those measurements, uh, and then we do a little bit of book learning and understanding uh, what we're actually doing. Right. So, it, you know, you have a very interesting background. You work as a lawyer now. You have a degree in engineering. So, I guess, <clears throat> and you've been involved with this organization uh, for some time now. You know, I guess, what what is most important to you in the work that you guys are doing? Um, and, and what drives you to continue to be involved in this organization? Well, first, I think it's a very important uh, issue. Uh, the climate change question is uh, something that uh, is evolving. Uh, we we uh, have seen uh, major changes in temperature over a period of time uh, with uh, the measurements of carbon dioxide that have been measured, let's say, at a fairly pristine area uh, on Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see the car concentrations rising, and we see a, a correlation, uh, a physical connection, uh, a scientific uh, physical connection with the, the CO2 as potentially creating warming through the greenhouse effect. Uh, and then there's a correlation that we see that, that confirms um, uh, some of our uh, uh, theories of understanding of, of this greenhouse theory. Uh, so I think it's very important. Um, I also think it's very important to uh, give students, young people, an opportunity to study science, to be out in nature. Uh, the Emersonian triangle, so to speak, uh, science, nature, and books. Mm -hmm. uh, to be out in nature, to study. So we will do uh, lectures each night on a field of science. Uh, a professor or a guest lecturer will come in and speak on their area of expertise and give a college or graduate level uh, course uh, throughout the summer, and students will obtain uh, college and uh, graduate's credits towards uh, their degree uh, by participating in our program. So for myself, I, I think it's important to continue the science, to continue good science, mm -hmm. uh, to have a program that uh, is uh, apolitical, and to maintain uh, uh, trust and faith in our observations and the science that we produce. I is that what you mean by good science? Good science, yes. So uh, would you touch upon examples of potentially bad science? Well, I mean, uh, science has a, uh, a way of measuring things that uh, can't necessarily be, be fuddled with. But mm -hmm. sometimes uh, we present the information in a way that uh, we like to see it. Um, again, it's observation, uh, and the observed results are seen through a lens that is sometimes our own. We're seeing, th everybody sees things through their own eyes, their own perspective, their own perception. And uh, where you have good peer review allows one to uh, 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 reestablish some, uh, some, some baseline neutrality uh, with a number of individuals. Mm -hmm. Now, I, in, in, in academia, 
Uh, we have uh, uh, the opportunity to study things based on grants, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes those grants are, are result-focused. Mm -hmm. And uh, as opposed to, let's say, a, a, a pure science where you're just going trying to understand something just what it is without necessarily what the results will be, mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a sort of a pure form of observation as opposed to, hey, I have uh, uh, some, some dollars to do this study, mm -hmm. and the study uh, will prove one thing, but not necessarily uh, prove the opposite, not or just prove the opposite. C could we zoom out for a second? Uh, if we were to look at, uh, I guess, the cycle of which um, funds or donations, whatever it might be, get directed to any type of scientific uh, institution, and then their obligation to then publish that data in order, I mean, it, is there, I mean, could you say that there's bias, maybe not in this organization, but in some organizations, that they're being funded by uh, organizations that are looking for a certain type of outcome? And is there, or is there anything in place to restrict that? Um, or is that, you know, not the case? Well, I, I think we're, we talk about, uh, Science and funding. I just uh, talking about it in the abstract. Certainly, uh, in the the world of possibilities, there are uh, organizations that probably mm -hmm. do do that. Uh, we we are we are funded by uh, government organizations, and we we do have an academic council that uh, reviews uh, what we're doing. Um, I, I I do see that how uh, funding, if you're trying to prove a point, uh, and a lot of money is going towards that point. Um, you may not be able to have uh, sufficient research uh, or funding to understand the opposite point of view. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, there are other organizations, for example, if the oil industry will fund uh, other such studies that say, hey, uh, we need to give you a different point of perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think if you have a peer review, good peer review system, uh, uh, you're ab able to take that research and, and vet it uh, across the board with uh, a neutrality because you are looking at a uh, scientific uh, uh, process. And the scientific process, if you have the data and you can see the data, mm -hmm. uh, will provide a, uh, a result uh, or a con conclusion. Mm -hmm. And that data uh, may either support that conclusion strongly mm -hmm. uh, or weakly, and it also might have other factors that uh, under the peer review process say, hey, uh, this, this may not be accurate because, this may not be accurate because. And we have that in our, in our program as well where we want to study the glacier on a year-to-year -year basis, mm -hmm. uh, but it's difficult because um, we have to uh, uh, dig test pits, do uh, uh, cross sections of the glacier, uh, uh, do a satellite observations which uh, have to be normalized, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of data uh, in the uh, environmental field has to go through that process. It's, it is a scientific process uh, to do that. But a lay person, when they come in, uh, mm -hmm. will think, huh, we, we've been monkeying with the data. We've been mm -hmm. playing with the data. And it doesn't really reflect these types of things. Uh, but I would, I would respond to that, that uh, under uh, uh, individuals who are familiar, people mm -hmm. of skill in the art, uh, in the right. scientific field, understand that this normalization is necessary and it does support the conclusion or the correlation that uh, is being provided. Right, I, I guess with the earlier question, thinking about zooming out and um, you know how that process works, right? You've got the scientific community that has a very close eye and understands that data. They may, you know, there may be an article that only has, you know, one headline that potentially could sway uh, public opinion, that could then influence children who grow up to be scientists, who grow up to work on specific things <clears throat> because of, you know, uh, cherry-picked information, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is you, you've got a scientific community which works within, uh, w with their peers and they're able to look at all the information, but the information and the way it's presented potentially outside of that community you know, you could have multiple graphs or, you know, if we just talk about data for a second, the way that you interpret data, and like you said, there are things that could be moved around, right? But 
even if you were to pull every derivative of, of information and graph or whatever it might be from a set of data, the ones that you cherry pick to then present to the public uh, or even present to a team uh, or that is that is potentially funding, uh, you know, there's there's still that human element of potential uh, uh, influence, right. I guess, in, in one way or another. Right. So um, I guess, you know, you, I, I'm not saying there's a world where nobody can write articles and simplify information uh, in in fear of swaying somebody one way or another. Uh, but even today we've seen with, you know, groups of fact checkers that maybe check facts more so in one area versus another. Um, so, you know, there, there's talk on on a level of bringing high schoolers to the glaciers, having these conversations, bringing in outside people. Um, how do you, um, how are you able to give maybe those small set of people information, uh, but then, or, or how are you able to then take that same type of experience uh, and potentially make it more uh, accessible to people across the world so that when you do peel back or if you make something that's more exciting um, in that space versus you know a sheet of charts and analysis and findings uh, make it more accessible to more people so uh, they move past I guess that yep. that first layer of information yeah uh, well it, it is really good to have um, a basic understanding of science when uh, looking at any of these things uh, we would we have our young students we go through uh, the very basics of, of the physics of, mm -hmm. of uh, the science and uh, and when we do that uh, it gives uh, the student understanding of, of how that information is, is collected. Uh, and so perhaps later on in life, uh, maybe when they get to college or graduate school, they say, or they can build upon that. Um, as for myself, I have the same experience. And so I, I, when I look at uh, uh, PhD level work, uh, and as, as a lawyer, I will rely on experts and I can poke holes into these things as well. Mm -hmm. um, I can ask the questions. Uh, and then I can see where uh, these conclusions are uh, a bit of a stretch or not, or if they're mm -hmm. solidly based. Um, and to have that, that basic science uh, background, that education is important uh, if one is going to be able to really understand uh, some, um, some of these issues. Now, not everyone is going to have that. A lay person will have uh, a different background. Not everyone has a strong uh, scientific background. Um, but for myself, uh, why, why then we do we ask that individual to opine on uh, the the exactitude of the science that's being produced? Mm -hmm. Now I, I can understand that. Let's say uh, you would like to say, "Oh, I am a PhD. I've got all these papers. Just trust me. Mm -hmm. Trust me because I know what I'm doing, or I have uh, uh, the consensus of all these other scientists, and you should just trust us." Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think there is uh, uh, an important consideration there because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're, right now we're providing science. We're providing information for policymakers, mm -hmm. and we'd like to be able to give a greater amount of trust that we're doing this according to a scientific process mm -hmm. uh, that can be used and, and uh, uh, intelligent decisions made uh, based on that information. Um, and. Uh, Again, like you were saying, if uh, a graph uh, of data can be taken out of context mm -hmm. and used in various ways uh, to persuade uh, an individual who may not be familiar with the science, uh, who you know is a layperson without that scientific background, mm -hmm. and uh, that that data, uh, that graph could be used in a persuasion. Well, provide an opposite conclusion that is uh, not necessarily the right conclusion, but that is actually supported by the data. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I say this because I, I will give talks in, uh, to others uh, who are, uh, uh, don't have faith in uh, the scientific community. They don't have faith in the academic community as to uh, some of the findings uh, mm -hmm. of climate change. And uh, the information that uh, they present to me is sometimes a blog or a website of uh, an armchair uh, scientist, a fellow who has a scientific degree but is not necessarily involved uh, in, in uh, you know, the research, mm -hmm. but will then present the information in a way that is persuasive to mm -hmm. a layperson uh, to believe that uh, you know, the, there should be an opposite conclusion. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and when I'm confronted with this information, I, I, I look at, I have to look at the source. I look at the source, and I don't discount the individual if he doesn't have a PhD or she doesn't have a, have a, uh, a, a tenured pr uh, track at, a, at an institution. Mm -hmm. But rather, I look at the information that they're providing. I look at the data, and I say, well, the data actually says this, and you're not counting all of these other things. And because I have that experience, I can explain that. Uh, quick, quick question. So, you know, if you look at, uh, I guess, the reason we see, hmm, okay. In, in situations where you have competition, you have less left versus right. Um, you have, you know, the yin and yang of competition, whether it's in a certain field or whatever it might be. Um, has there been anything as far as like an equal distribution to two opposing sides of a scientific research topic? Yeah. So that you, you constantly, and I understand you have the peer-to-peer, -peer, um, but in some way, some type of competition where people are using potentially the same data, but there's some accountability. I think the key here, and the reason maybe there isn't trust is in, in certain types of, you know, more scientific uh, areas is, is probably because they become politicized and there's you know mistrust in, in the political realm, realm as well right yes I don't know how many people are out there arguing about butterfly studies um, or, or, or something like that right but there are larger ramifications when it comes to allocating you know public tax dollars and things of that nature uh, 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 or even energy policies which we're seeing not go very well for you know yeah. Europe right yeah. now um, so I guess, is there anything in place or could it some kind of system, and by the way, I, I know very little about the space, I'm, I'm trying to learn through questions here. So uh, is there any type of system where you can have kind of two intelligent opposing, uh, you know, group of scientists look, look at the same data or gather data in the same area uh, to kind of challenge themselves? Well, I like where you're going with these, this question because it's something that I've, um, I'm keen on. Uh, to take scientific information and to provide it in a context that we can actually make intelligent decisions mm -hmm. and uh, and move past disagreement uh, on on things that are not uh, that shouldn't be disagreed upon. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, uh, reduce the the uh, potential for uh, uh, fractious debate mm -hmm. uh, and that to create a greater consensus. Um, and I, I, I've been studying uh, a question uh, that is uh, more philosophical, and that is just, uh, I would just say it's short, why we disagree about climate change. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have a group of scientists in a room uh, talking about this, mm -hmm. uh, I think if they had the same data, and they're mm -hmm. sitting down with the same data, let's say you have uh, uh, data from third parties provided in a binder on mm -hmm. all these different subject matters, and you went through uh, that binder of data, I think on, on average, uh, better than average, uh, they would come to a, a conclusion for, for what, sh uh, what that data represents, mm -hmm. what that data is. Now, uh, the question of what should be done with that data, uh, that, that is a, a different question. And, uh, and as I came here today, I, I wanted to frame a question to you, and, and this is something that we may want to discuss, mm -hmm. is whether or not uh, the notion that science can drive that consensus on policy and that better science will lead to, will settle our differences. Uh, now, I, I think that having a consensus, a scientific consensus is good. Let's say you get a number of individuals in a room, science, a scientists in a room to discuss these matters. They will be able to, using a scientific process, use a scientific method, come at the question in a, in a similar way, uh, and that is to resolve the, the issue. They might come from different directions to resolve that issue because their backgrounds. Uh -huh. Now, I'll give you uh, uh, an analogy. Um, the uh, uh, the I think it was the Open Banking Committee uh, provides uh, an opportunity for uh, specialists in the field of finance and banking uh -huh. uh, and, uh, to set monetary policy. And so, uh, to setting monetary policy, the Fed will, will want to uh, provide uh, uh, an impetus for uh, uh, greater uh, uh, ability to finance through uh, 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 the federal funds rate mm -hmm. and uh, essentially heat up the temperature of the economy. That is, allow 
uh, greater flow of, of uh, goods, that i.e. financing, to mm -hmm. allow for uh, uh, freer flow of, of money, the mm -hmm. economy. Uh, but that there is a give and take uh, with that equation because mm -hmm. that will also create inflation. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we are seeing that today, and that's, that's a, a prime issue that we're talking about today, but we have a fairly effective uh, mechanism for taking data that's collected by third parties mm -hmm. and uh, uh, have a, a number of individuals around a room uh, to decide on those policies, decide on that data, say what this data is, and then present that information to policymakers to say, well, what should we do? Should we increase the temperature of the economy or mm -hmm. reduce the temperature of the economy to uh, provide for the, the greatest benefit? And one of the greatest benefits are, and I think uh, uh, one of the things in terms of the long run of how we are so successful, at least in this country, mm -hmm. is even though we don't make changes quickly, we make changes slowly, in it, but they're always in a positive direction. We maintain a fairly uh, uh, even keel in our policy. Variations, fluctuations, changes have costs beyond what we see in terms of volatility. Uh, and so having, having let's say, a, a policy that uh, a group of individuals can come around mm -hmm. and maintain a, uh, a direction of policy mm -hmm. uh, long term uh, that avoids fluctuation as the political cycle uh, rolls uh, will benefit us greater because we'll have uh, uh, a long-term vision that we can maintain uh, a, a direction without without the consequences of, of, of changing uh, a policy 180 degrees each time uh, uh, we have a new, new group uh, who decides what is best. Right, um, well I, I think there's a few things uh, to unpack there. So um, <clears throat> if we were essentially to think about all the data that gets tested, curated, the people in the field, going between sites, uh, putting this information then into something that's uh, then translatable into information that can then be handed off to uh, a policymaker or the public. You know, you've also, there's, there's so much work on that back end for so much to shift in the interpretation or the beliefs of the person it's then handed off to. Yeah. And I think the issue here, uh, and it's maybe an issue that will never get solved or maybe only get solved for a certain amount of people, um, in, in almost every interaction with other humans, there's, there's opposing or uh, self-interest. There's uh, uh, obligations that they have within themselves or within the organizations they're around. Um, for instance, someone may uh, take a little more shit at work versus uh, you know at a baseball game where they owe people nothing, but now that they're being recorded potentially for doing something, uh, that can then come back to affect their work, their family, their children, things of that nature. Um, and I, I guess in an instance of if you're a scientist who's getting funded and somebody is asking behind closed doors to focus on one thing over another, uh, that's potentially an issue. Uh, that's also coming from the government. And because it's politicized, depending on the party, they may be looking for different answers in the data, or they may only extrapolate a certain piece that could suggest potentially something. Um, and I think the issue there becomes when that information is then presented, not fully with you know a PhD level of understanding, but from a couple articles, a couple headlines, uh, and then that person, if they're, if that topic is high on their decision making skills, uh, or not skills, but uh, uh, the, their weight of the decision of who they choose to elect. For instance, you could choose someone who believes very highly and is potentially very effective in that exact topic, but they may harm you or improve other parts of your life that you're not even looking at, right? So, I mean, that, that's an issue is as long as time uh, being able to fully understand the uh, intent of the other person, yeah. right? There's also no accountability when somebody does come to power for them to actually <clears throat> do what they need to do um, uh, or, or, or do what they promised they would do. Uh, because those, you know, we've seen that all the time. Where oh, you know, the the Senate or the House is is, is not on our side, or whatever it might be. Things are constantly shifting. Um, so, uh, I, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to think about is is there a way through some kind of um, non 
you know, when the funds come in, if they could come from a non-political or uh, non-government, or if it is distributed in one way or another, um, how is it done in a way that makes sense to fund the actual research without looking at... Wait, there's more. To listen to the next part of this episode, please follow the Platform Catalog.